Hi there, everybody. It's Saturday morning, August 26, 9 o'clock in the morning. I've already did my seven miles of running. Coffee is ready. Got that in hand as well. So wanted to talk about a little bit about what's happening in the Gulf, what's happened overnight while you were sleeping, and some of the model data that I'm seeing. A couple of notes that I want to kind of start with and kind of set the tone for where I want to go with the way I'm going to talk about this storm. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of model plots with me from me or even individual tracks. Uh, really going to try to back off on that. And I really want you to be very careful about looking at that on social media. Number one, they're confusing. Number two, there's a 100% chance that the storm will not follow any single model track. Okay, that's proven. Uh, the models tend to favor certain tracks and they stick with them. Uh, also, when you look back at forecasting history, there is only one forecast that has been proven over and over again to be the most accurate. And it's not a model. It's the National Hurricane Center. They outperformed the Euro, the GFS, the NAM, the HWRF, and whatever else you want to you list out there. Their forecast consistently, and this has been proven and shown to us over again, is always the most accurate. Now... Having said that, where the center tracks is not important. The impacts of a tropical system go well outside where that center tracks. And that's all those model lines are showing you. The model lines are showing you where the center is going to go. They're not showing you that there are going to be tornadoes 300 miles to the east or a surge that's going to be up to 100 miles to the east of the center. They're not going to show you the strong thunderstorms or the flooding rains that are going to pop up north and east of the center. They're just showing you where that little point is going to travel. And I really don't want us to focus on that because as we've seen with previous tropical systems, sometimes the biggest impacts are nowhere near the center. I remember when Irma was approaching southwest Florida, some of the worst flooding was in downtown Miami. The surge there was incredible. I think it was Ian as it was entering uh, portions of South Florida the day before there were tornadoes in Fort Lauderdale. So, I mean, you really have to look at this in a big picture impact kind of way. So let's get to it. Let me show you what's going on here this morning. Let's start off with the satellite picture and, uh, you know, everything is on track. Uh, look at this. You can definitely see what I'm talking about this morning. The, the, the satellite picture here changes color because the sun is rising, so you're able to see the true color of things from the satellite. The ball of convection has held together throughout the overnight. There is definitely a developing tropical system between Cozumel and the western tip of Cuba right there in that uh, passageway from the Caribbean to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, let me show you another satellite picture here. It's going to be a little bit closer. This is a visible satellite, so it's just from this morning. It's about to refresh, actually, about 20 seconds, so we get the latest image. Uh, and it definitely shows a, a consistent ball of convection here with this storm. Hard to tell where the center is. Looking at some of the banding, you see there is these bands of showers and thunderstorms, these uh, feeding into the storm. That kind of makes it seem like the center is probably, I mean, it's right between the Yucatan, probably, if there's a developing center between the Yucatan and the western tip of Cuba. We're not going to know that until a hurricane center goes in there. It's hard to make that out on the visible satellite, which they would, of course, use. So they're definitely going to be flying airplanes in here today, trying to get an idea of where the center is. And once we know where the center is and that there is a center, we will be much more, much better prepared to actually start tracking this thing. And that's really uh, the important thing. Now, as far as the chances for development, well, 70% that this thing is going to become a depression or tropical storm in the next two days, 90% seven days. So slow development continues. Uh, a couple of things about this map, and it's my fault that I haven't explained this to you. This red area is the area that the hurricane center thinks a storm may develop. It's not necessarily the track of the storm, okay? Now, in this case, it is very likely that this tropical system will continue to move north or northeast through this red area. But, you know, it could be slow to develop. So I think what the Hurricane Center is doing here when they, when they draw this, this large area is they say, okay, well, it could develop here if it develops early. Let me actually let me use a different color here so you can 
better see. I'm going to use something like a, a bright green. So what they're saying is, okay, well, if the low develops early, it's going to be down here. But if it takes until Monday to develop, well, it could be anywhere here. And if for some reason it develops much later than that into Tuesday morning, well, it would be up here. So this is basically showing the areas where formation may take place. It is not showing you where the track is going to go. Obviously, because we don't have a center pinpointed, there's nothing really input into the models. There's an estimated center. The Hurricane Center is tracking this. They have a center kind of pinpointed generally, uh, but we don't have one perfectly uh, mapped just yet. So the models have been back and forth. So I do want to show you one thing. The, the GFS yesterday had a hurricane making landfall in Panama City. Today has a, a weak tropical storm. So there's the GFS. All right. I mean, it is what it is. The GFS has been all over the place. But I want to show you here is the European. And this is where this is where I start to pay attention. The European. So this is a forecast that was released by the European last uh, or that would be uh, yeah, so that would be last night, and then 12 hours earlier, 12 hours earlier, 12 hours earlier. The the position of the storm, now the position has changed in terms of how far northeast it is because it's it's adjusted the timing, but the European, from all the way back from, let's say, this goes back to, uh, let's see, the latest one would be... Three days ago, so three days ago, the 24th, so yeah, three days, two days ago, to today, the European basically has had the same track. Two days ago to now, one, two, three, four, five model runs. It's showing the same track, about the same strength system, looking about the same way. This is where you start to pay attention to a model. If a model, the, the, the GFS had nothing to a hurricane, to a tropical storm, it's all over the place. The European has been very, very consistent. And that is something that I am definitely noticing. I'm not saying that the European forecast track is the one that's going to happen, but man, you know, five in a row here and it's not budging. What does it know? You know, what, it's, it's pretty convinced. What, what are we looking at here? So I think, I think that's something to really take note. Uh, the European track is closer to our coast. I think this thing is going to track closer to our coast. Is it going to make landfall anywhere near us? Too early to tell for that. But it is going to track closer to our coast. And because of that, uh, we are going to see some impacts. And in terms of intensity, the model's also pretty clustered. You don't want to follow any particular line here. But most of the models are in this green area for intensity, anywhere between a minimal to a strong to moderate tropical storm uh, in the green, greenish tropical storm. A couple of these models do go up there to even Cat 1 or Cat 2 hurricanes, but these would be tracks that would send the storm over more water. These would be tracks toward the panhandle versus the Big Bend. It would spend more time over warmer water versus a track farther east where the storm would impact and interact with land. Uh, much more so. So development probably would not be as fast. Here are the plots. Again, none of these are actually going to happen. Uh, the storm is not going to follow any one of these tracks and they will continue to shift. So I think that's also important. Uh, I do want to pull up a map though of the state of Florida and kind of talk about the potential impacts from this, right? Because that's all you want to know. First of all, I know, I understand uh, everyone here has flights this week. You have doctor's appointments. You have life. Life is going on and you've got it and you want to know what to do. Uh, I can't tell you anything. I, I don't know how your particular situation at a specific time and date is going to be exactly impacted by the storm. Obviously, if you have travel plans on Tuesday and Wednesday, here's my advice. If it's going to cost you a significant amount of money to make those changes now, I wouldn't. And that's because as watches and warnings get issued, the airlines will allow you to do so for free. So I would wait and take advantage of that opportunity if, if need be. If the storm tracks closer to us, there may be lots of flights cancellations. If it tracks farther west, there may be delays instead of cancellations. So it's really, really hard to tell how anything is going to be impacted. But let's talk about this. Let's talk about the track of the storm. Let's say it takes what I think was the more favored track, something like this, somewhere up the coast, let's say Steenhatchee, 
maybe it's going to be, you know, Crawfordville up here, or maybe even Cedar Key. I mean, that's possible, right? Any of these tracks are possible. What we need to focus on here, and I'll just leave that middle line open, is that when the center of the storm takes this kind of path, and even if it goes all the way back towards, towards Apalachicola back here, uh, the winds on the east side of the storm are all out of the south. This is what they're going to do. The winds go like this. They're all out of the south. And the water here is shallow, and it starts to pile up because of the curvature of the coast. The coast literally starts to catch the Gulf of Mexico, and you will get a water rise. You could get a storm surge, not just in the Florida Big Bend, but in Citrus, Hernando, Pasco, and Pinellas counties. You could get a water rise in the bay as the Gulf of Mexico, remember the bay is the Gulf of Mexico, gets pushed into the bay. You could get a water rise there. So the impacts along the coast, and these are the, the ones we watch for the most, are going to be well away from the center. The other thing is, is if this storm does track the way it's looking to now, whether it tracks towards Tallahassee or you know Cedar Key, there are going to be significant impacts in terms of rainfall and thunderstorms all across the peninsula here. So you're looking at all across the Florida Peninsula, there are going to be thunderstorms and heavy rain, a tornado watch is possible. All of this is likely going to happen across the peninsula. Now, if the storm goes out towards Panama City and Pensacola, a lot of that may stay out to sea. So uh, if, if this really goes the GFS's way, right now I don't think it will, uh, and this thing goes way west, then we'll probably miss out on the heaviest amounts. But if it goes like an Ada did up here towards the Big Bend, then we're going to get rain and thunderstorms along the coast. Heaviest rain is probably going to be to the west of 75. There may be a tornado watch. Heavy rain could cause localized flooding. So the impacts are going to be well away from the center, right? This is not going to be just where the center goes. And especially if this maintains tropical storm intensity, uh, and that's what a lot of the models are showing, is a, a moderate tropical storm. Uh, the tides of concern, uh, I've posted this on Facebook yesterday, here's what I'm kind of watching in terms of that. That would be Wednesday, and it's the Wednesday afternoon high tide, okay? So this is going to be Wednesday, all right, telestration is not going to work, but it's going to be Wednesday later in the afternoon. So here it's showing that this is for the Gandy 253, but the high tides between Pinellas and Hillsborough County, they're really going to vary uh, anywhere between uh, noon and 3 p.m. So the early afternoon high tides on Wednesday would probably be the ones to watch. And they're, they're pretty high. They're astronomically high, 3.4 feet at the Gandy. I believe they're around three feet out in the Gulf of Mexico along the Pinellas County coast. So, uh, you know, the tide's already at three at its highest level. And then you're going to get a push of some wind pushing in water. So you could get water levels that are two, three feet, depending on the strength, maybe four feet above where they typically are. And that could cause some minor coastal flooding. Uh, but as we've seen there, we do have communities and neighborhoods and places where even two, three feet of uh, water above normal high tide levels is going to cause an issue to roads, to businesses, or even to homes. So that is something that we definitely have to watch. And that could be a concern, even if the storm goes way out into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the last thing I want to address is, is intensity. Uh, a lot of you are thinking or maybe seeing posts, and by the way, uh, I love storm chasers. Uh, they're wonderful, but you have to remember they have an emotional hook to this. This is their adrenaline rush. They want a big, nasty hurricane, and they will always wish for that. But we really have to approach this with some reason here. Uh, yes, we've had some big storms strengthen rapidly as they enter the Gulf of Mexico, Irma and, and Michael and, and uh, Ian, but when they entered the Gulf, they were already well-structured storms. Hurricanes or strong tropical storms, they were already at a pretty high level of organization. So when it got over that hot water, 
they were really able to take advantage of it. This thing is developing right over that warm water. It is well behind in terms of its structure or organization than where those storms were. So I don't think you're going to be able to get to a Category 4 or 5 hurricane, uh, at least at this point, looking at, at the data, just by passing over, you know, three, four hundred miles of, of, of these warm ocean waters. Uh, so I really think that the, the intensity forecast where they're at now, I think they're very reasonable. Again, most models keep this a tropical storm, maybe a category one hurricane. If it were to go well to the west or northwest, it's possible it could become a little bit stronger than that. But by then it would be impacting the panhandle and not our area here across west central Florida. Uh, so that's the latest here. Uh, thanks for joining me for this uh, in-depth update. I'll have a l another one later this afternoon. There's no reason to do these too frequently as uh, there's not going to be a lot of changes between now and later, unless the Hurricane Center starts issuing advisories. For those quick hit updates, at Greg D. Weather on Instagram, follow me there. I've got 90-second videos that are posted there for updates in my reels. You'll also see any graphics in my stories uh, to kind of keep things moving. I'm always cognizant of the fact that social media may pull up a piece of information from two to three days ago, and you may see it today because of an algorithm. So I try to put a date and time on as many things as I can. And make sure you pay attention to that when you're reading these maps, when you see a post online, before you start reacting to it, question when the data was created. Are you seeing a model plot from two days ago? Or are you seeing one from this morning? And that's really important because remember, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, X, uh, Threads, Facebook, they work off algorithms. And if you keep liking posts of model data, they're going to start showing you more model data, and it's not going to be in chronological order. They may show you something from today, then the next one's going to be from two days ago, then the next one may be from 12 hours ago. So you really have to pay attention. When was the data created? Scrutinize everything, because I know many of you are looking at this to make decisions, and I want you to make informed, well-thought-out decisions, not emotional ones, okay? All right, that's the latest here. Uh, it's Saturday. That's Lazy Day at our house. I don't know what you guys are doing, but we basically veg out, though I do have some dinner plans with visiting friends later this afternoon in St. Pete at the beach, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. Uh, by the way, if you stuck around this far, hot tip for today, it's Dennis Phillips' birthday. Go to his page. Wish him a happy birthday. All right, everybody, have a great Saturday.